This is Otsal, and two miles from Salford's town hall, ships lie at anchor on the greasy water, silhouetted against the sombre background of a city. Here is the face of old Salford, a bitter face ingrained by dirt and sweat. They say there's money in dirt, where there's muck there's brass, but there's no pride, no dignity. It's not a good place to live in, with one of the highest mortality rates in the country. God knows what you breathe here, for Otsal is no smokeless zone. Even in the early hours of the morning, its nearby industrial chimneys go on belching, adding to an atmosphere already polluted. No nightingales sing in Bexley Square, but the industrial machine still requires the human brain to guide it, and slowly and sluggishly the city stirs to life, coal fires adding their contribution to the carbonised air while beneath a panorama of rooftops, the day begins. And then, gradually, the first few people come out on the streets. They don't have far to go. One step and you're outside. There are no long drives or gardens to get in the way. The postman can deliver early in these parts. Everyone seems burdened, as on already tired feet the long trek to work begins. Without a glance at a dog scratching for non-existent earth to cover the scent of his excretion. But in Ordsall, stray dogs are too common a sight to bother over. It's people, young and old, and at that time of morning concerned only with the day before them. Each human being in his or her little world. Labourer, craftsman, shopkeeper or counterhand. The individual units that blended together form the pattern of a city now spreading outwards like the spokes of a wheel, travelling on foot, by bicycle, the occasional car, and of course, inevitably, the early morning wait for the bus. Human cargo being transported by one method or another to individual destinations and individual tasks, and the city has come to life. sun, reflecting on the smiling carefree faces of the children, against one of the few patches of green in an area once described as the great forest three miles long by three miles broad, where kings and nobles followed the pleasures of the chase. The sun has other side effects, bringing out the women in their never-ending frustrating fight against the grind. Something in the human spirit that always tries to rise above the effects of decay and time. If you can pay for the effort, well and good. If you can't, as they say round here, if thou does out for now, do it for thyself. And in this part of Salford, there's a lot that has to be done for thyself. Until the welcome relief of the morning cup of tea, with time out for a natter. Something to break up the monotony of the daily routine. Doesn't work for some. I know how you feel, love. At times it does get you down. This area of Lancashire has the most famous, if that is the correct word, back entries in the country. In a dying area such as this, they're often dirty. They harbour everything from flies to old bedding. When the wind is right, they form a natural tunnel for anything that can be airborne and in wet weather things float down them. But these alleyways are the private connecting links between the people. From a suitable back entry you can watch the world go by. Mind you, they're not the same since they bricked up the old ash middens. It's not so long ago that the banana man sold his fruit down the entry, and even today you can often hear and see a rag and bone man with his donkey stones. Give him a pile of old woolens, and he'll give you a couple of whitening stones. While you're about threatens. And unfortunately, not all the coalmen are as good-natured as this one, when faced with the nearest thing to a long-distance hike.
feel lame assured as you watch the girls go back to work? For the women are part of Salford's industrial wealth. Fitting for a city supposedly named after Sally Ford, a gossiping woman. Though historians will tell you that one derivation of Salford is Hall of the Lord, and that another is Shallow Ford. But whatever might be the truth in this respect, it is claimed with good reason that Salford was the birthplace of the textile industry. In the 14th century, Sir John Radcliffe of Odsall, asked to name his reward for services rendered to the free burghers of Flanders, successfully requested that he might be allowed to bring to England a party of Flemish weavers, thus laying one of the foundations of England's industrial supremacy at that time. And centuries later, the women of Salford made the Lancashire cotton men wealthy by working for starvation wages in the huge, gloomy cotton mills. Even today, their daughters work under conditions ranging from modern factories to near sweatshops. Factories converted from cinemas, churches, attics knocked together, and in some cases, the same old cotton mills their parents knew so well. You've got to be a Lancashire machinist to appreciate facing a figurative dead horse early Monday morning. And there are some advantages of a kind. If the factory does look ugly from the outside, towering like a brick colossus over the neighbouring buildings, at least you don't have far to go for work. It's just next door. The majority of streets here are play streets, unofficially so in many cases, because with rare exceptions there's nowhere to play but the streets. Here are your playgrounds, your porches and sun lounges, and whatever else you can use them for, from pavement cafes to garages. It's an area with a distinctive personality of its own. It doesn't even become more picturesque with time, just uglier, with too many little dirty corners. A throwback to Victorian times when the working man was one step removed from a serf and presumed grateful for what little he received. But to be fair, the observer must look behind the mean facade and understand that these are the people left behind. That for everyone here, Another has been rehoused under conditions undreamed of by the preceding generation. And the people still in Odsal are waiting. The task is gigantic. Meanwhile, where royal carriages once rolled down to the banks of the Irwell for the cockfights, children play in the dirt. There is tradition here, and the passing will not be without nostalgia. Queen Elizabeth I is said to have visited Odsall Hall, and nearby there is a stone-covered passage that is claimed, but without proof, to be the one down which Guy Fawkes, Gatesby and Mistress Anne escaped when the hall was attacked. Here was the ancestral home of the great Radcliffe family, which for centuries played so distinguished a part in the affairs of Salford, Lancashire and wider afield. Salford was a manor and royal property back in Anglo-Saxon times, held by Edward the Confessor, and later referred to as the Manor of Odsall with two water mills, a fulling mill, etc., and 20 acres of land in Shoresworth, held of the Queen by the sixth part of a knight's fee and a rent of 69 and sixpence. The people of Salford Faces lined and seamed, but steadfast. The faces of any community anywhere. The city is not made of bricks and mortar alone, but needs humanity to instill life. Though in the end, with awful finality, the surroundings will stamp their indelible mark on the inhabitants. Faces like these can be seen in the slums of America, 
the peat bogs of Ireland, the poor villages of Spain, and countless other places where the oppression of squalor and near poverty exist. And yet, ironically and often inexplicably, this same squalor will force to the top people who in their various ways will add something permanent to the heritage of their world. But life still goes on, and inevitably, death. Now demolition is well underway, but framed against a broken skyline, the pub's there to the bitter end, like the last decayed tooth, which seems to suggest that someone in authority appreciates the priorities. Salford is now a conglomeration of old and new, with these corner shops belonging to the old, fighting desperately against the twin menaces of demolition in the supermarket. Here, progress is the enemy. For the present, the small shops try to compete. They work longer and harder hours. You name it, and if they haven't got it, they'll get it for you. But this type of corner shop is vanishing, along with a cold water, bathless, terraced house. And a reputed race of shopkeepers is destined to become a nation of supermarkets. And while the change is inevitable in the bright new world to come, can one be so sure that this time it's all for the good? And now, for the time being, Odsall, many of its mean streets graced by noble names, houses a high proportion of the old and infirm, the very young and the dogs. Soon even the sight of football in the street could disappear. With an extra 15 acres of land he marked, there would be playing fields for all, to grace the intended 4,000 new dwellings, replacing the 6,000 old homes being demolished over the next 10 years. The little narrow streets near the docks, choked by parked and moving vehicles, will make way for modern car parks, as befits our 20th century age. Meanwhile, the road to Wembley can still start in a Salford back street. And it's not only adversity that brings people together. Pleasure, any form of relaxation does the trick as well. Though here it seems that the enjoyment is often forced. The faces do not always match up to the tinsel and lights. But at least there's no colour bar, and everybody's money is accepted without objection. This fair is an annual event, but today far removed from its original basic conception, a great periodical market for the sale of merchandise. Now the attractions of candy floss and the ingenuity of the mechanical entertainments. And the Laskers off their boats, and the hair in curlers housewives have one thing in common, a search for the make-believe world of raucous music and bright lights.
social gaiety of the fair, from the sad and lonely view of humanity's rejects, home. And home on this occasion is a terraced house, two up and two down, and an outside toilet that has to be seen to be believed, a slum house. And the strongest part of some of them is the overlying stench. Occupied on an average by four people, and an uncounted number of cockroaches who seemingly are the only occupants to thrive. The houses standing in tired, weary ranks were built about 1880 and probably all the rage at that time. It's bath night and this is the system you use when you have no running hot water. You boil cold water on the gas stove and you're severely limited to the amount you can heat this way. And then, of course, there's the cost of the gas. There's no room in the house which is already bursting at the seams. Four children and two adults live here and share the two bedrooms. There's another daughter, but she sleeps around the corner at her grandmother's. The prince's living room is approximately 12 feet by 8. You can't paper the walls. They're permanently damp and the paper won't stick for long. Coal is stored in an inside cupboard barely three feet from the dining table. You can't accuse the princes of storing coal in their bath. They haven't got one. Just a galvanized container left in the open when it's not being used. If you take a plumb line to any one of these houses, you'll find each one its own leaning tower. This particular house is privately owned. The rent is 22 shillings a week, which does not leave much room for the extensive repairs and improvements required. There comes a stage with any item house, car or equipment, where the deterioration is too far advanced and any money spent on it is wasted. And this house passed that point of no return many years ago. The princes are waiting patiently for decent accommodation, which was originally promised in the reasonably near future. Now they've been told there's another delay. You can't blame the present Salford Council when one appreciates the task with which they're faced. Then who is to blame? Where does the blame lie for these old houses in Salford and other slum areas? Before the war, the rent of these pigeon pens was approximately eight shillings a week, of which rates and other outgoings brought the sum down to the five to six shilling mark. At that time, many people bought this type of property for investment, but soon discovered that the financial return was not as good as the estate agent's figures promised. Even at that time, one ordinary repair could swallow the gross income from a number of weeks' rent. And so the custom of investing savings in this type of rented property died out. From the first, the rent was strictly controlled at an uneconomical figure. After the war, it did go up by about 50%, whilst everything else was doubling and trebling itself, including repairs. And this type of property became a liability, almost ruining some small owners. And so they began to get rid of them as fast as they could if they were lucky for a token price to a sitting tenant, or gave them away for nothing. And as the position grew worse, paid to have them taken off their hands by a man of straw who couldn't be liable for anything. And in the majority of cases, the local council found itself saddled with property it didn't want. Today, many corporations are offering large sums of money for the renovating of old houses. Why couldn't this have been done a long time ago? or alternatively, a reasonable rent allowed on condition repairs and renovations were carried out. It's common sense that if a landlord, and they're not all grasping, has property out of which he draws an income, it is to his benefit to see that his investment is maintained in a fair and reasonable condition. For in our modern age, a bath and running hot water are not luxuries. Thank <laughs> you. 
forecast of things to come. We have seen a small part of the Salford made famous by playwrights, authors and painters. Soon the ugly streets will remain only on canvas and film. Hobson will be making his choice on stage long after the area has been ground to rubble. And though it is fitting that man shall improve his existence, there is that touch of sadness, the sorrowful memory passing of the old to make way for the new. I found my love by the gas works cross. Dreamed a dream by the old canal. Kiss my girl by the factory Drifting across the moon Cats are crawling along the beach Springs are good in the street at night Dirty old town Dirty old town 
for a train Set the night on fire Smell the spring On the smoky wind Dirty old town Dirty old town sores of the city beneath. The children bathed and now sleeping. The children who will one day inherit the new Salford. For there will be another day and a less tolerant generation. Oh, oh.